And that is it for us tonight here on the Ingram Angle. Shannon Bream is up next. Miss Shannon. Laura, I cannot wait to see that movie. I heard it is fantastic. Me too. Have a great show. You too. All right. Thanks, Laura. Here's what's coming up on our show tonight. Tonight, days before Christmas, transit nightmares across the country. When you see the pictures, it's pretty horrific. And Congressman Dave Brad is here with details on new calls to improve our nation's infrastructure, all while Republicans seek to put tax reform on the president's desk by Christmas. Plus, President Trump unveils his national security strategy. With this strategy, we are calling for a great reawakening of America. We'll break down Donald diplomacy and... I think we've opened the door for anybody to come here, get arrested, and suddenly we're going to be responsible for providing abortions. Another pivotal case in the effort to allow abortions for illegals. A federal judge ordering the Trump administration to allow two illegal immigrant teens to terminate their pregnancies. We'll have the latest. And when night court convenes, our legal eagles will debate the latest fight to get rid of the four words that comprise our national motto, In God We Trust. And welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington, and this is a Fox News Alert. New tonight on the deadly derailment of a brand new high-speed Amtrak train in Washington state. Train number 501 was making its inaugural run of a new service from Seattle to Portland when its 132-ton locomotive dropped onto the southbound lanes of the Northwest's busiest travel corridor, Interstate 5. Authorities say it was going more than 80 miles an hour, about a quarter mile before it entered a curve where the speed limit was much lower. Amtrak issuing a statement in the last hour tweeting this. There is a thorough investigation underway to determine what happened. We will not speculate about the cause and we encourage others not to speculate as well. Taking out a spring, uh, Dan Springer, he is in DuPont, Washington with the very latest. Hi, Dan. Yeah, hey, Shannon, more than 12 hours after this horrific accident, all lanes of I-5 South here in DuPont remain closed, and crews continue to work to try to shore up uh, the trestle where this train left the tracks at 7.40 this morning at the heart of rush hour traffic, and then several of the train cars came careening down off of that uh, bridge, down onto five vehicles on the interstate. Uh, of the 14 cars and, and engine of that train, 13 of them left the tracks, many of them coming down. It was a chaotic scene right after these initial moments were picked up on scanners. Take a listen. Track 501, emergency, emergency, emergency. We are on the ground. We are on the bridge. Five in the uh, That'll do. Easy stop, track On the freeway. Need EMS. ASAP. It looks like they're already starting to show up. There was a dramatic and frantic search and rescue effort as first responders and frankly motorists who were stuck behind this tried to free train passengers who were trapped inside. Um, there were several people who were describing the fact that they had to crash, uh, break out windows and uh, use the jaws of life to get inside these trains that, that dangled over the edge. All the victims who were killed today were on the train. Uh, we're now starting to hear some of the stories from survivors and they were harrowing stories. It hit my face, and so the inside of my mouth is all cut up, and uh, hit my jaw. I got a bunged up my knee and a rib, but I'm basically fine. Well, the cars uh, ahead of us went down the hill, and ours was stopped by hitting that tree. We also heard a story of an Eagle Scout who uh, gave aid and assistance to some of the victims of this uh, horrible train crash. An NTSB GO team um, has started to arrive. A couple of members are here. More will be arriving from Washington, D.C. later tonight. Uh, we have a news conference going on uh, across the street here. Uh, we're going to be hearing from local officials, but uh, the NTSB is really the ones who will be in charge of this investigation, and they will no doubt be looking at speed as uh, a possible factor in this. Numerous reports today that this train was traveling about 80 miles per hour within a quarter mile of a sharp bend, and that bend is where the train left the track. So uh, that, the speed limit in that area at that curve 
is supposed to be 30 miles an hour. So there is a black box that's on this train that will be analyzed, and they will be looking into whether or not this train properly slowed down. As you mentioned, Shanna, Shannon, this was the inaugural run for this train. It was a, a speed train that was supposed to cut about 15 minutes uh, for commuters or people traveling from Seattle to, to Portland, uh, taking that trip down a little bit. And it was the very first run. They had been testing this, though, since about January of 2017. So they've run several tests, but this was the very first time that passengers were on board. There were 80 passengers on board and five crew. And we have a confirmation of three deaths, but there could be more because they've not been able to get inside mm -hmm. and look inside all of those cars. There could be more bodies inside. Shannon. Well, Dan, I know that you're monitoring a press conference there now with state officials. We understand the NTSB later tonight, overnight here for the East Coast. Uh, we'll be weighing in as well. So we'll check back with you as we get more news. Dan, thank you very much. Okay. Well, the president unveiling his national security strategy today, outlining the Trump doctrine, which is America first. Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry joins us now with what it means for America's defense policy for years to come. Good evening, Ed. Shannon, good to see you. An interesting contrast that on the day Politico reported out a long story with fresh evidence that then-President Barack Obama went easy on the terror group Hezbollah in order to smooth passage of his signature Iran nuclear deal. President Trump became the first commander-in-chief to unveil a specific national security strategy in the first year of his administration, and it was based entirely on that America First campaign platform you mentioned. No accident either. The president chose the Ronald Reagan building here in Washington to deliver this speech that was all about projecting his plans to rebuild American military strength at a time of great anxiousness around the world over rogue nations like Iran, North Korea, and to show how hard he's breaking from his most recent predecessor predecessor. Look at this comparison. The Obama 2015 national security strategy included 16 mentions of human rights, two mentions of LGBTQ rights. The Trump 2017 strategy, one mention of human rights, zero mentions of LGBTQ. The president focused instead on four pillars, protect the American people and the homeland and what he called the American way of life, including strengthening border security, promote American prosperity, talked a lot about the economy, uh, removing regulations, tax reform and new trade deals, preserve peace through strength, more of that Reagan message, rebuilding and re-equipping re the U.S. military, also advancing American influence around the world, and, as he put it, championing our values while not seeking to impose our way of life on anyone. Here's how he laid it all out. If we rediscover our resolve and commit ourselves to compete and win again, then together we will leave our children and our grandchildren a nation that is stronger, better, freer, prouder, and yes, an America that is greater than ever before. As you heard there, competition, another big theme. The president taking criticism today for being very antagonistic toward China, even though some of those same critics had said earlier this year the president should have been tougher on his trip to China. Democrats also miffed that he made no mention of Russian interference in the last election, though the president did say Russia is using, quote, tools in an attempt to undermine the legitimacy of democracies. He's also taking heat tonight for dropping any mention of climate change as a national security threat. But that's criticism the White House welcomes. Because again, this was meant as a direct contrast from the Obama years. Shannon? And we're going to talk about how much of a contrast it was coming up. Ed Henry, thank you very thank much. You. Republicans stand on the end of a year-end victory, and it looks like Wall Street is betting on tax reform actually passing both the House and the Senate in the days ahead. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gaining 140 points. The Dow has risen 5,000 points in a year for the first time ever. Still, Democrats are pointing to polls indicating the tax reform plan before Congress is unpopular. Fox News Politics editor Chris Steyerwald, who is popular, joins us now. Good to I see you, Chris. I'm only polling in the mid-30s. <laughs> we'll yeah. take a Twitter poll. To okay, see. okay, that's fine. But it's good to have you here. Okay, so let's talk about this poll. Quinnipiac, uh, when they're asked, do you approve or disappro disapprove of the Republican tax plan? Although I have to say, it's been tweaked and modified you know, a little bit here and there over the days. 26% uh, say they approve, 55% say they disapprove, 18%, eh, I don't really know. But where has this gotten off track for the Republicans? Because what they keep telling us is everybody's getting money back. Well, look at it this way. It's unpopular, not just in the Quinnipiac Bowl, it's just unpopular. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know what else was unpopular? Obamacare, mm -hmm. which the Democrats did in a not dissimilar manner right. uh, as their first year legislative achievement when they had control of the Senate, when they had control of the House, when they had control of the White House. And 
it was unpopular when they started. Obamacare didn't get popular really until the Republicans tried to repeal it, actually. Right. That's how this stuff works. <laughs> That's how this stuff works. So the Democrats right now are saying, this bill is hot garbage. It's unpopular. The people hate it. You're going to pass it, and then it's going to hurt you next year. We have no idea. Mm -hmm. We have no earthly idea because all of this now depends on the economy, which is already good, which is already going at a good Moving clip right, right now mm -hmm. and has been for a year uh, or more, really since the middle of 2016. What this all depends on now for the Republicans is if the economy goes great guns and people feel optimistic, it's not just the stock market, it's that, that wages go up, that, right. that things get they better. They have more money in their pockets. That people have more money in their pockets. If that happens, then maybe it's great for the Republicans, but we don't know now. Right. Okay. So former uh, New York Congressman uh, Steve Israel was a Democrat. Uh, he said today House Republicans were caught between probably losing their majority by passing no bill and possibly losing their majority by passing a bad bill. So really, it, it, like you said, it sounds like the proof is going to be in the pudding because it doesn't matter what the polls say now. If a year from now when we're, you know, just past the midterms, but people feel like I've got more money in the bank, I can put more food on the table and buy more Christmas presents. Well, that's what's going to matter when they vote. Israel's not wrong. Israel's a smart guy. Um, and he's right about this. If they don't, if the Republican, the Republican base are affluent suburbanites, basically. The real base of the Republican Party are people mostly with college degrees, mostly who live in the suburbs, uh, a lot of white people. Uh, and these are the people who want tax cuts, right? Mm -hmm. They want tax cuts. They want, uh, and corporate tax cuts don't bother them because I believe, as Mitt Romney said, corporations are people too, my mm -hmm. friend. As the Supreme Court has also said. As the said. Supreme Court has also ruled. Mm -hmm. uh, but so if they can't get results for those people, those voters who are their real base are going to be crabby. The danger for Republicans now are the voters who switched and went from Obama to Trump mm -hmm. in upper Midwest states. Mm -hmm. These people sit in a lot of key congressional districts. If Democrats can come forward with a populist economic message to say the Republicans turn their backs on you, you mm -hmm. voted for them last year or two years ago, they're turning your, their backs on you and they're focusing on fat cats on Wall Street, that could hurt Republicans right. in, that, in that part of the country and they've got to keep an eye on that. They do. Okay, I want to ask you about the speech the president gave today, uh, laying out his uh, plans for national security, his strategy. Uh, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, not a fan. She says this in part, the administration is offering the world only further incoherence and confusion. And she, she talked about how he's provoking North Korea and, and upsetting our allies all over the planet and not uh, really upsetting our enemies. We're not doing a good job. I'm so surprised she didn't like it. I know, I it's I would have thought she would have come in with a ringing endorsement. Uh, I wish that he wouldn't have talked about the train crash in conjunction with infrastructure spending. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was too, and because we have too no soon. idea, we have no well, idea yeah, what exactly the cause what was. Happened. And that, was, that wasn't cool. Um, but generally, this was just a campaign speech. Uh, this was a function of 1986 law that changed the way military uh, operations mm -hmm. were organized and they threw in there oh and the president needs to come out with a statement every once in a while so every once in a while the president comes out with a statement and says stuff so for if you're obama it's lgbtq and global warming and if you're trump you say well actually national our national security structure is about tax cuts and rolling Locking back down regulations the border and, yeah. yeah the economy it's whatever you want it's ice your own cupcake all right well i will tell nancy pelosi you're going to call her after the show <laughs> okay as you often do uh, every, <laughs> Chris Arrow, good to see you. You bet. All right, White House officials confirming today that Vice President Mike Pence will preside over the Senate tax vote. That means the Vice President's trip to Egypt and Israel scheduled for this week is postponed. He was scheduled to leave Tuesday evening for Cairo. It appears the trip will likely be rescheduled, we think, for mid-January. A White House official saying, quote, the tax vote is in good shape, but we don't want to take any chances. Hmm. Well, President Trump dismissing rumors swirling around Capitol Hill that he's considering firing special counsel Robert Mueller. Though the president and his legal team are upset about the way Mueller obtained and is using thousands of emails sent and received by his presidential transition team. Legal scholar Jonathan Turley calls the move to go around the transition team and through the General Services Administration to get those emails, quote, legally unprecedented and strategically reckless and says it has the potential to actually hurt the case in the end. Mueller's office argues investigators have done nothing wrong. Well, tough questions tonight about infrastructure funding in the wake of the Washington State train tragedy. Congressman Dave Bratt joins us on that funding fight. And while we wait to see if the GOP gets the tax bill across the finish line and avoid a government shutdown, all that's got to happen before Christmas Day. We'll ask him about that. And later, an incredible story that U.S. officials describe as sabotage by the Obama administration against government efforts to fight terrorists tied to Iran. More on that coming up.
This is a Fox News alert on the Washington State train tragedy. We just got a statement from the FBI. The agency is saying this at this time. There's no information to suggest an elevated risk to Washington residents. The FBI will continue to assess information as it develops on that crash. NTSB headed there as well. Well, President Trump tweeting that today's tragic train derailment only underscores the need for Congress to tackle infrastructure. Quote, the train accident that just occurred in DuPont, Washington, shows more than ever why our soon-to-be submitted infrastructure plan must be approved quickly. $7 trillion spent in the Middle East while our roads, bridges, tunnels, railways, and more crumble. Not for long. Well, the renewed push comes as the GOP hopes to put tax reform on the president's desk by the end of the week and also avert a government shutdown. For more, we're bringing in Virginia Republican Congressman Dave Bratz. you got a lot going on. A lot going on Welcome this week, Shannon. Welcome for making Thank time you. for us tonight. You bet. Okay, before we get to infrastructure, let's talk about taxes. Yep. Uh, you got to get that across the finish line tonight. Here is what uh, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi says. The GOP tax scam is not tax reform. It is a Frankenstein's monster of giveaways to the wealthy and powerful that will explode the deficit and pillage middle class America. That sounds like the exact opposite of how you guys are selling it. So what's true? Yeah, well, the average family, single woman uh, at home with a kid is going to get over $1,000 back. 70,000 family with two kids married gets 2000 back, right? That's the big talking point. And you can just go through it line by line by line, right? Ba ba every category is better off. The corporate rate is going to make us competitive again internationally, right? Ireland is at 13%. We're at 35. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, all else equal, we're going to put a plant. So it's so all where's good. where's the Frankenstein part? No, I mean, they, they have to say something, right? And the, the curious thing is the mainstream media this week, they're paying attention to the deficit, right? Mm -hmm. I, I go walk around and you can tell people that try to maintain some modicum of being in the middle. Say, I'm worried about the deficit. So that's a hint. Well, at the end of this week, the proof will be in, right? Schumer and Pelosi will be asking for what at the end of this week? You need money. Increase spending. I mean, spending midnight Friday through, night, right. you're done. Through the roof. And it, and they're going to push us, right? We won the House and the Senate mm -hmm. and the White House. People want less spending. They want less federal government, right? Government is good, right? Local, state. But they want less federal government for sure. And so we're trying to move in that direction, but you're going to see. So they're saying we want less debt and deficit. And the tax plan, right? There's a, I just want to clarify that. I taught economics for 20 years. Right. And so the tax plan, the narrow plan itself, right? Will that totally pay for itself? Uh, that's in question. You can argue that, but the economy. But does that not worry you? No, no, it doesn't because the economy will, right? So the mainstream media has missed. You mean it's going to it's going to yeah. gin up enough that it's going to cover yeah, and it the already will be there. And it already is, right? So we're growing at three, and the Federal Reserve saying we're at four next quarter, and the quarter after that. And so, I mean, we're on this huge trajectory. The market's up. That's a signal of the real underlying economy. Do you think it's falsely up, though? No, I don't. And the sign that the underlying economy is more, the stock market, that could be, mm -hmm. right? No one, you know, you can't bet whether there's a little bubble in there somewhere. But the real, the underlying economy, the best sign that that is for real now is the Fed's going to raise interest rates, right? Mm -hmm. Quarter, 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 quarter. There, that. They haven't done that in the past. It's been zero for eight years. So we've had four trillion dollars in the bank vaults, right? How power mm -hmm. money and seven hundred uh, billion dollar deficits, both of which are hugely stimulative. And we just grew at one and a half. OK, you know, you still have some GOP folks to convince as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, your buddy Lee Zeldin, he's a Republican out of New York. Yep. Uh, yep. He has said this on balance. This bill remains a geographic redistribution of wealth, taking extra money from a place like New York to pay for deeper tax cuts elsewhere. New York is a net contributor that now will be contributing even more. This bill chooses winners and losers in a way that could have and should have been avoided. Yeah. Lee's a great guy. Uh, I get he's he's got to represent his district. Mm -hmm. I, I totally respect that. Uh, but the tax bill isn't the part to talk about redistribution of income, right? The tax bill, you want kind of efficiency, right? And so in our plan, tax reform, we didn't get it perfect. Uh, but we, we got rid of a lot of deductions, a lot of the special interests, and that's the goal, right, is to harmonize taxes smoothly across everyone. Everybody gets a fair deal. Everyone's sick of the swamp. President Trump ran against that. Bernie ran against that. The left mm -hmm. forgets, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the middle class hasn't seen a wage increase in 30 to 40 years. Real wages up. They've been flat for 40 years. That's what the last election was about. And so now you're going to see kids being able to get jobs. I taught college for 20 years. Kids are going to be able to get jobs. Wages are going to go up. And in a year, you'll see, right? And if you really want to know who's telling the truth, right, don't ask politicians. Go to Vegas, right? Mm -hmm. Vegas now, you can basically see bets on anything. It's like the stock market, mm -hmm. right? So you can put a bet down on how much economic growth, what will the deficit be, uh, anything you want. And go look there, and if you want to find the truth, it's right there. 
Uh, finding the truth in Vegas. That's right. something we never thought we'd be right. advocating no, for, but hey. There's some information um, there. What do you think the odds are on getting a funding bill done before midnight Friday? Uh, I think, yeah, over 95%. Okay. Yep. Third, that'll be, that's going to be we'll taxes be here, Tuesday, counting Wednesday, it down. Wednesday so. budget, Thursday, Friday. And again, just to be rep repetitive, the Democrats are going to be pushing for more and more spending. And they're the ones saying they're concerned about the deficit. So it's a little ironic. The Freedom Caucus, we fight every year right before mm -hmm. Christmas to try and get some rational restraint on spending. And so the people can watch and figure out who's telling the truth. But the bottom line lesson is go to Vegas to find the truth. Right. No, go. Right. <laughs> okay. Of, Good to see you, Congressman. <laughs> you, Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Shannon. All right. Up next, Anita Hill making headlines as Hollywood tries to produce a cure for the sex harassment epidemic. Trace Gallagher with details you do not want to miss. And it's vintage San Francisco. Find out why a seller of secondhand clothes is facing draconian punishment all by the Green Police. Hollywood's trying to deal with the onslaught of sexual harassment allegations plaguing the entertainment industry. And who it's turning to is raising plenty of questions. Trace Gallagher joins us now to explain what's being called the Hollywood Hills solution. Good evening, Trace. Good evening, Shannon. Hollywood was certainly ground zero for the Me Too movement, which prompted dozens of allegations of sexual misconduct and in turn led to dozens of people being held responsible. Now the power of Me Too has proven to be the driving force behind a group of Hollywood executives banding together to form the Commission on Sexual Harassment. It's a panel composed and funded by some of the industry's biggest heavy hitters, like Disney chief Bob Iger and Nina Shah, who co-chairs the Nike Foundation. But to lead the charge they have chosen Brandeis law professor Anita Hill, who became notable for coming forward in 1991 to accuse Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment. Hill says she's proud to lead this effort, quoting, it is time to end the culture of silence. I've been at this work for 26 years. This moment presents us with an unprecedented opportunity to make a real change. One of the executives also spearheading the new commission is Kathleen Kennedy, who produced franchises like Jurassic Park and Star Wars. Kennedy says for Hollywood, this marks a new era. And coincidentally, that new era begins with tonight's premiere of All the Money in the World about the kidnapping of J. Paul Getty's son. Kevin Spacey was supposed to play Getty, but after a series of sexual harassment allegations, Spacey was replaced with Christopher Plummer. But surprisingly, Ridley Scott, the director who replaced Kevin Spacey, said this about the flood of allegations. Listen. I think it's reaching overkill. To a certain extent, look after yourself. Certainly, don't go into an apartment to meet someone. Don't go into a bar. Go to the bloody office. Mm. The fallout is also still prevalent in business, politics, and sports. Carolina Panthers owner Jerry Richardson is now selling his team after being accused of what Sports Illustrated calls inappropriate and sexually suggestive comments and at least one racial slur. And today ESPN, which has dealt with its own sexual misconduct allegations, lost its president when John Skipper resigned. Skipper says it's because of substance abuse problems and he's embarrassed about letting down the people that he cares about. Shannon. All right, Trace Gallagher with the latest out of LA. Thank you. The world's busiest airport shut down after an underground fire left Atlanta's Hartsfield International Airport without power for almost 11 hours. But even as power is restored, thousands of travelers remain stranded. Jonathan Seri tells us what happened and what's being done now. As you can see, I'm walking through the baggage claim where many busy travelers are finally being reunited with their luggage. By midday, Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport was already operating at about 95% capacity, and ticket counter lines were actually getting shorter as passengers were finally being routed onto new flights after about 1,600 were canceled over the past two days. Georgia Power continues to investigate the fire that broke out in an underground electrical room, knocking out both the main power supply to the airport as well as secondary emergency backup power lines. Airport officials say what happened was a freak event that is unlikely to repeat itself. Nevertheless, they say there are lessons learned that they can carry forward. Now, the cause of this outage, it was most certainly accidental. However, it does raise some questions among counterterrorism experts about the vulnerability of our nation's infrastructure.
the Atlanta airport is the world's busiest airport, which begs the question, how are the other airports doing? How is London Heathrow or Dubai or, or any of the major uh, Asian airports doing? And so this is going to give an opportunity for people to take a look and see what they're doing and see if there's a best practice. What made this power outage especially disruptive is it occurred during the normally busy holiday travel season. At least now that the airport is slowly returning back to normal, these passengers can get back to their normally hectic routines they expect this time of year. Shannon. Jonathan Seary in Atlanta, thank you so much. All right, Pope Francis says fake news is a sin. The Pope made the charge to Catholic media Saturday, criticizing journalists who sensationalize the news and bring up old scandals, calling it a grave sin. The Pope says he believes journalists perform a fundamental mission and should provide correct, complete, and precise information and avoid one-sided reporting. Well, San Francisco judge hitting Cecily Ann Hansen, the 68-year-old owner of a San Francisco boutique, with steep fines and penalties. Trouble started after California Fish and Wildlife agents seized clothing made out of materials from endangered species like cheetahs, leopards, and rare turtles from the store. Hansen pleaded no contest, but she told the court all those items she sold were made decades ago, even a century ago, because it's a vintage shop called Decades of Fashion. Despite that, the judge fined her $3,600, sentenced her to 500 hours of community service and three years of probation. Well, Satanists launches a legal challenge to our national motto, In God We Trust. Will they take it all the way to the Supreme Court? Stick around for tonight's session of Night Courts. And now that Roy Moore has lost his run for the U.S. Senate, Al Franken's being urged to put his resignation on hold. Which Democrats are urging him to stick around tonight? A very serious charge tonight against the Obama administration. A bombshell report alleging they deliberately sabotaged the government's own efforts to fight terrorist drug and money laundering operations. Correspondent Doug McElway digs into that report. Today, the United States, together with our allies and partners, has reached a historic understanding with Iran. At what cost was the nuclear deal with Iran reached? A Politico investigation alleges the Obama administration, in an effort to reach the agreement, drastically curtailed efforts to interdict cocaine shipments into the U.S. by Hezbollah, a terrorist organization closely allied with Iran. For years, it has been known that Hezbollah had been active in the Latin American drug trade. In 2016, a DEA official told a congressional panel that Operation Cassandra, a massive law enforcement effort to stop the Hezbollah drug trade, was inexplicably curtailed. For some unknown reason, we seem to have missed, uh, missed out on one opportunity after another. We seem to have forgotten about the importance of disrupting the supply chain. Politico reports, quote, when Project Cassandra leaders sought approval for some significant investigations, prosecutions, arrests, and financial sanctions, officials at the Justice and Treasury Departments delayed, hindered, or rejected their requests. There clearly is a huge pattern here. I mean, we pull out of Iraq largely because the Iranians want us out of there. And President Obama has no political and moral commitment to uh, an Iraqi end state that's in the United States' interest. From 2009 January to the entire eight years of the Obama administration, hands off anything to do with the Iranians and their proxies. Several former Obama administration officials did not respond to our request for comment. A spokesman for Mr. Obama told Politico the administration was hard on Hezbollah, quote, through tough sanctions and law enforcement actions. The Trump administration has taken an entirely different tack in its Iran policy. That course change reflected in sober comments here on Friday from Secretary Mattis. He told reporters, quote, everywhere you find turmoil, you find Iran's hand in it. Shannon, back to you. All right, Doug McElway with the latest. Thank you. Well, President Trump unveiling his national security strategy today and restoring references to the jihadist terror threat to shift from former President Obama's strategy. Mr. Obama controversially removed terms like Islamic extremism in the 2010 security documents and then focused heavily on things like LGBTQ and human rights issues overseas. Meanwhile, the Trump administration is responding to claims that officials at the CDC are being banned from using certain words, including transgender and fetus in official documents. Joining us now, Washington Times opinion editor Charlie Hurt and a Fox News contributor, and Rachel Bade, a political reporter who covers Capitol Hill. 
All right, guys, great to see you tonight Good for a little you. vocabulary yes. police. Yes. Uh, okay, so let's talk first about um, the president, um, Charlie, using some words that had disappeared almost um, virtually overnight for the past eight years. He's bringing them back. Why yeah. is it important? Well, I mean, you know, this is a signature of, of the campaign that he's run and, and the, the administration that he's put together. Uh, he changes the way people talk. And, he, you know, the, what he did to, to, with political correctness and, and the way he went after the media, uh, those were some of his strongest themes in, in the campaign. And, and calling uh, things exactly what they are, such as jihadist terrorism or, or uh, what have you, uh, that that was one of the things that appealed the most to so many of his supporters, and so uh, this, so this is and and by the way, I think that you know the idea of of naming Jerusalem the capital of Israel is another one of those things where every you know, normally politicians tiptoe around this mm -hmm. and they don't want to put a fine point on it, but this guy has no problem with just putting a fine by point. By the way, on. that move not so popular at the UN today um, <laughs> yeah. as they took a vote on that. Okay, now at the same time, this administration was bringing back these words is being accused of banning some other words. This, this is a, a tweet from Nancy Pelosi. Uh, she says, Republicans want to deliberately control your thoughts and words. Vulnerable, entitlement, diversity, transgender, fetus, evidence-based, and science-based are some of the words they want to delete from your mind. Now, this was aimed at the CDC. So the director of the CDC posted on Facebook, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, saying this, I want to assure you there are no banned words at CDC, CDC. I want to assure you that CDC remains committed to our public health mission as a science and evidence-based institution. But Rachel, this got a lot of attention. Yeah, I think it shows you that um, reaching for the vocabulary book to sort of appease the base works sometimes, but not other times. Um, for instance, on the jihadist move, I think most Americans agree with the president when it comes to saying words like jihadist terrorism, et cetera, um, calling a spade a spade. When it comes to things like CDC words using things like diversity, evidence-based, science-based, these are not necessarily politically charged words. So I think a lot of people had questions about that. Um, one of the words that was also in there was transgender. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because on Capitol Hill, a lot of Republicans don't want to touch social issues. Mm -hmm. They don't want to touch LGBT mm -hmm. at all because it does split the base. So I think that the jihadist um, discussion in terms of like bringing that back worked better than this other um, change he made, which Democrats are attacking. Well, but the CDC is denying it. They say there are no banned words. So denying or walking back? I well, think is a good yeah, we'll, we'll have to keep <laughs> digging on that. In the meantime, yeah. we want to talk about this idea that uh, Senator Al Franken, who announced from the floor that he would be resigning within the next few weeks, and you guys know my Nancy Drew. I never thought he was going anywhere. Uh, and now there are there was an editorial last week, I think it was in the New York Times, saying he shouldn't resign, he should unresign. Now we have a Senator Joe Manchin saying this about whether he should go. I definitely think he should not resign. I think he should submit himself, which he has willingly done and offered to do, and go through this complete process of an extensive uh, ethics review. And whatever the outcome is, I will live with it. Okay, there are reportedly other Democratic senators uh, that are also stepping up and saying, Charlie, that, you know, he can, he can stick around. Yeah, well, as you were one of the first to point out, it was very strange that he said, <laughs> at some point in the coming weeks, I'm going to, uh, to, to resign. And it did sound like he was waiting for the Roy Moore right. election. And whether, you know, if, he, if Roy Moore won, then he wouldn't be the pervious guy in the Senate. And if he didn't win, well, that's where we are now. And so it's, I guess everything has changed a little bit. But I also think that, um, that they're, they're banking on the idea that the, that the Senate Ethics Committee will do what the Senate Ethics Committee always does, which is bury things. And take forever. And take forever. Uh, but Rachel, you think maybe he actually goes? Yeah, I think so. Um, talking to some Senate Democrats, the consensus seems to be that, um, yes, there's a debate opening up right now about where is the line on sexual harassment, where, when do people have to leave and when can they potentially stay. Um, I think that in order to stay, we would have to see um, at least one female Senate Democrat switch her position on this. And from what we understand, the Senate Democrats um, are very tightly knit, uh, the women in there are very tightly knit and have been talking about this for a long time, still think he should go. Um, but it, it opens up this debate. I mean, like a lot of people are asking right now, when are we supposed to push members out of Congress? Is one accusation enough? Mm -hmm. How many um, do we have to see in order to send someone home? And that's a question yeah. we don't have the answer yeah. to yet. I think in his case, having pictures and multiple accusations with the same story <laughs> is, is going to be tough for him. And the fact that they've now appointed a female to fill that seat or right. named her. So we'll see. If he um, stays, the picture will haunt them. Yes, it will.
Uh, and that lieutenant governor who's waiting for that seat might haunt him as well. <laughs> All right, yeah. uh, Rachel and Charlie, good to see you both tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for to coming. See you. All right, one of President Trump's nominees for a spot on a Washington, D.C. federal court has taken himself out of consideration. Comes after a video went viral of that nominee, Federal Election Commission member Matthew Peterson, struggling to answer legal questions about trial work, which he's never done during his confirmation hearing. And a prominent judge on the country's largest federal appeals court is resigning over sexual harassment allegations. Alex Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals says battles over the accusations would not be good for the judiciary. Washington Post reports at least 15 women have made allegations that go back for decades. Well, breaking news of the legal variety, two more underage teens in the U.S. illegally want abortions. We've just gotten the judge's ruling next on the, we'll tell you more about that. Plus, Night Court convenes on the case of a devil worshiper who wants to outlaw our motto, in God we trust. Uh, we wouldn't tell you about it if it wasn't true. Stick around. This is a Fox News alert. A federal judge is ordering the Trump administration to allow two pregnant illegal immigrant teenagers to obtain abortions here in the U.S. The ACLU brought the case for the two 17-year-olds. One is 10 weeks pregnant. The other is 22 weeks along. The judge is giving the administration 24 hours to appeal the ruling, which it's done with a teen who is 10 weeks pregnant, including an emergency filing with the U.S. Supreme Court. The situation is similar to that of another 17-year-old illegal immigrant who was able to obtain an abortion. You'll remember we covered that case in October. Time now for Night Courts. Kenneth Mayle, a self-proclaimed Satanist, says it is time to ditch our country's motto, In God We Trust. A federal judge in Chicago has tossed his lawsuit, but he's not given up, appealing to the Seventh Circuit. So let's convene Night Court on the question of the constitutionality of the motto. Attorneys Jesse Weber and Mercedes Colwin join us now. Great to have you both tonight. Thank you for having Great me. To be on. Okay, so I want to start by reading a little bit of what the judge outlined that this gentleman had to say. It says the plaintiff says the nation's money, which has the motto, In God We Trust, forces him to carry forth a government message proclaiming the existence of God and professing trust in that God. He alleges that by using American currency, he's compelled to proselytize for an official government ideology that professes faith in one God. Jesse, why should he be forced to do that? So I think this is absolutely ridiculous. This is nothing about sponsoring a religion or endorsing a religion or anything of that nature. This is about ceremony. This is about patriotism. You carrying a coin around where the imprint, the engraving is so small, it's not going to be go seen by anybody as a public endorsement, an advertisement of religion in any way. It's not interfering with his ability to practice or believe whatever he wants to do. It's nothing about this. This signage has been around for 60 years in our nation is built upon values and built upon documents that mention God. It has nothing to do with sponsoring a religion in any way. All right, Mercedes, uh, you know the Supreme Court had uh, a case not long ago um, that taught, well, it was actually long ago, it was in the 70s, but they, it was about whether you could force someone to have a license plate on their car that had a certain message, and the Supreme Court talked about, you know, differences there. Um, and, and so this judge, in tossing this guy's lawsuit, quoted from another decision saying this, printing the motto on currency is distinguishable from forcing an individual to salute the flag or display a license plate. No reasonable viewer would think a person handling money does so to spread its religion message. Does this guy have a case? So I'm taking one for the team tonight by being the devil's advocate. <laughs> so frankly, looking at this case, so he is a non-theastic Satanist. Basically, he doesn't, he doesn't have any faith that there's a supernatural deity. And he is very, he claims, and, and he's argued, that there's constitutional violation by carrying currency because he is actually going forward with the message, government's message, that there is a God. That's contrary, completely contrary to his beliefs and his views. That the, in the currency, it says it clearly, in God we trust. So the message is that there is a God, one, and two, that there is trust. And in the argument, and obviously in, in, the, in the district court, it was rejected, which now could be appealed beyond to the Court of Appeals, Seventh Circuit, and then ultimately to the Supreme Court if it goes beyond that. He's arguing, what well, there's, there's a constitutional issue, number one, the fact that the restoration, the Religious Restoration Act specifically says that the government can't substantially burden someone's exercise of religion. These are his religious views. There is no God. Secondly, the, the First Amendment says very clearly that it can't infringe a person's exercise of freedom of religion. And then he goes on to say that there is the, the fact that, that he's then being discriminated against because 
he doesn't believe in God. He's required to, mm -hmm. to carry this currency, yet the government embraces those who do believe in God. And, fr and lastly, it's a whole issue about the freedom of, of speech, where he is he's giving forth the message, the message, the government's message that there is God. Well, maybe he could use like just debit and credit cards so he doesn't have to actually touch the currency or, or deal with it. Or Bitcoin. Or, That's a whole nother debate. Right. Um, but we're going to watch sure. and see what happens. We understand this case will proceed in the Seventh Circuit early next year. So we'll have to see which one of you. And we know, Mercedes, you're taking one for the team here. But we thank you guys for representing both sides. Tweet us and tell us what you think about this case at Shannon Bream or at Fox News Night. We'd love to hear how you would rule in this case. Thank you both. More news straight ahead. We do expect the NTSB to brief reporters a couple of hours from now as it begins the painstaking process of determining what caused the inaugural trip of a new high-speed train to derail in Washington state. Three people have been confirmed dead. There are fears, though, that number could climb as crews are able to get to all the damaged cars. Meanwhile, keep an eye on Fox News for coverage of tax reform as it heads through the House of Representatives, then to the Senate. It may have to swing back through the House, but the bill is ultimately expected to pass. It would be a signature achievement for the Trump administration, the President Valley to pass it by Christmas. Most watched, most trusted, and most grateful you spent the evening with us. Good night from Washington. I'm Shannon Bream.